Friends, this has been a gorgeous September, reminding us that we have a creator, a God who manufactures all this and makes all this and makes every day new. Friends, let us worship God. I invite you to stand and worship God. There is a story about a man who lived most of his life on autopilot. He suddenly wakes up and realizes he is very good. Now he has the opportunity to do something we all desire to do. To actually live a better story. Jesus came to change the story of our lives. Let us worship in the name of the one who gives us abundant life. Our prayer of confession. Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have lived boring and often uneventful lives because we have not listened to your voice. We have left undone those things we ought to have done, and we have done those things we ought not to have done. Have mercy upon us and forgive us. Help us to hear your voice and follow your lead that we may have life and have it abundantly. Amen. A moment of silence. If we claim we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share the peace of Christ. Would the children, would the children please join me up front for a moment? Well, good morning. Thank you for joining me up here this morning. Now, I want to talk to you this morning about where our offering goes for Sunday school. You know, we collect it every morning upstairs before we start in our little basket. Yeah, well, we collect it, and it's a, it's a small amount of money. Sometimes we might bring quarters, sometimes pennies, sometimes a dollar. You might think, oh, that one little quarter is not going to add up. But we collect it all year long. And so it really starts to add up with every, if everybody brings a little bit. So last year we collected money for the Heifer Project and we bought flocks of chicks for families. Remember that? And we had in our display, and going down the hallway, I had I made up a little display. Remember that this little guy was out there? And there were these, yeah, there were little baby chicks, right? And the little baby chicks represented how much money we were raising. So. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let everyone, now that we're done with the chicks, everyone can take a chick home. Some of them have little, little tags on them and that just tells you a little fact about the chicken. You know what, you can have two. Do you wanna take two? Because I know they are so adorable, yes. And so we raised enough to buy 13 flocks of chicks last year. And because Miss Lindsay here was really smart and the Heifer Project always emails me, I knew when it was double match day. And so we actually, we purchased 26 flocks of chicks. So that's a lot of chickens to help families to raise for income. So now this year, our offering, oh, where's the chickies' eyeballs? Okay, let me, let me see the eyeballs of the chickies and you guys too. Okay. So this year, our money is going to Fish and Loaves Food Pantry. And it's located in Taylor, kind of on the way like, to the airport. And it's a really special food pantry because it's, it was started by, a ch by churches, kind of like ours, that really wanted to help out families in the community. 
And so they accept donations of food, but they are really good at shopping. And on their website, it says that for every dollar, that they can provide three meals. So that's like 33 cents a meal. That's that, they, so they are really good at shopping. And so all of our money is going to is going to go to them this year. And so this year, instead of the little chickies, I found these little picnic baskets. So in our little display window, yeah, Emmy helped me make this one, right? So in our display window, for every $10, I'm gonna add a new basket. So all year long, we can see how much we raised. And we already have enough for almost two baskets already. So we're gonna have, a, how many baskets do you think we'll end up by, by June? A lot, do you think so? Yeah, I'm hoping. A hundred of these baskets? Oh my gosh, that's a lot. Oh, I don't have that many, yikes. I'm gonna have to buy some more baskets. I don't have that many, but that would be amazing. We'd be able to feed a lot of people. Oh my goodness, all right. Would you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for all the blessings you've given to us. Help us to be generous and kind to others, amen. Let us pray. Good Shepherd, you call us by name, and we know your voice. Open the gate for us that we might be enlightened and inspired and empowered to live bold, exciting lives of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. The first reading this morning is from John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Very truly, I tell you, Anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was trying to say to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The word of the Lord. Jesus has a vision for our lives. Jesus has a vision, a picture of a preferred future for your life and for my life. And Jesus' vision for our lives is contained in this one sentence. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. In this sermon, I hope to capture what Jesus means by abundant life. Last week, I took a quick road trip to central Illinois, where I'm from. Two of my three kids were there. It was a wonderful visit. My three kids are scattered all over, some over 2,000 miles away, so we don't get together as often as we'd like. But it worked for a couple of days in central Illinois, which is corn country. So I saw a great deal of this. The corn is about 10 feet high now. It's almost ready to harvest. Do you know how many cobs of corn come off a single stalk? Yes, ask urban people and they say five or six. But in actuality, it's one. The average number of cobs on a single stalk of corn is 1.2. Only one in five has two cobs. Now you'd think they'd be better at that by now and you know genetically alter this, but 
it's, it's easier to grow more single stocks than to grow more cobs on one stock. There you go. When that question's on jeopardy, you got it. <laughs> Driving through the massive cornfields of central Illinois, this one word came to my mind, flourish. The earth flourishes in an abundance of life. It is amazing how much corn they can grow. Now, they GPS every square inch of a field, and they can tell which part of the field yields more and which part yields less. And then they can program a computer to put on the fertilizer and the feeder and specifically to the foot provide nutrition so that the yield is consistently high every place in the field. It is amazing. Abundant life. Flourishing life. This, I think, Jesus is what Jesus was getting at when he says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. It's something like this. My vision for your life is to flourish. Jesus makes it possible for us to flourish in at least four ways. First, we flourish as we live a larger and better story. We love stories. This is the way God made us. God loves stories. So God made us with story-shaped imaginations. And in some ways, we understand our lives as a story. Jesus told stories. We call them parables. Our scripture reading today is something of a story that Jesus told. We understand things through stories. We appreciate reason and rationality, facts and figures, data and critical analysis, but we find the truth in stories. That's why we love the story arts, why we love literature, the theater, television, and especially the movies. Movies are the literature of our time. And there we are. Somehow the story on the screen helps us to understand our own story, the story of our lives. What is a story? A story is a character who wants something and has to overcome a conflict or address a challenge to meet it. A character who wants something it has to overcome a challenge or address a conflict in order to meet it. And stories have three parts. They have a beginning, a middle, and the end. Think about your own life. We understand it in these terms. We love the beginning stories, where we were from, who our parents were, that we were born in the middle of a cornfield and grew up there. We love that the seed of the rest of the story is somehow in the beginning. And then there's the messy middle. It's always messy in the middle. There's twists, there's turns, there's lessons learned. There's all kinds of stuff that happens in the middle. And unfortunately, we learn most of life's lessons by making mistakes and growing from them. And then there's the end, the conclusion, the summing up. And we see how it all fits together as a narrative, as a story. Now here's the thing. Most people think that their story begins with their birth and ends with their death. But that's not true for those who follow Jesus. Those who follow Jesus have a different story, a larger story, a story that begins with the people of faith, 
and that includes the people of the Old Testament and the New Testament and the early church and those for centuries who kept the faith and those who changed the faith and those who added to the faith, and then we come in. And, but after us, there's going to be more people who will proceed with the faith and build onto our legacy. The story of the people of God is not limited to a lifetime. It's not even limited to a millennium. It's almost a timeless story. Reinhold Niebuhr, theologian from last century, said a very wise thing that sort of highlights this understanding. He said, never start something that can be finished in one lifetime. We should all be starting things and doing things that we will not see the finish of. It's kind of like having a family. You have your children. You have your grandchildren. You have your great-grandchildren. And it goes on and on and on. This is the story of God. And the odd thing about the story of God is that it does We don't choose it as much as it chooses us. Our core identity as followers of Jesus is that God chooses us. The heart of the sense of who we are in the world is that God chooses us. Central to our understanding of who we are is that God chooses us. So in the story of God and the story of God's people, There is God, who is the primary agent and actor. And this is the hardest thing for us to adopt into our own stories. That we are not the author. God chooses us to be part of God's story in the world, and we flourish when we live in this larger and better story We flourish when the story of our lives intersects with the story of God. Two. Second, we flourish when we experience reconciliation. Part of our story is that we all have regrets. We all have things we've done or said that we wish we had not. We all have things that we have not done or said that we wish we had. And the problem is, it is very hard to release the guilt on our own. I must say, I am always puzzled when I hear the well-intentioned advice, forgive yourself. That's next to impossible for me to do. When I do manage to forgive myself, It's an awful lot like rationalization. It's like, well, I'm guilty, but only this much, and the real problem is the other person who's guilty this much. I never really get to the point where I can lay it all down, where I can put it behind me, where I can be entirely free of the burden and I carry the burdens with me every day, and they get heavier and heavier as the day goes on, so that by the time I'm trying to go to sleep at night, I just feel the weight. Only God can provide the forgiveness that we need. Jesus died on the cross and was raised to new life to bring us the reality of reconciliation with God. Rembrandt's picture of the prodigal son, another story Jesus told, who was a far off, long way away, realized what he had done, comes back to his father's welcoming embrace. No speech, no groveling, no confession, No, nothing. Just welcome home. 
Through Jesus, God reconciles us so that nothing may separate us from God's love, and thus we are empowered to reconcile with one another. God's one agenda item in this world is reconciliation. People who are far apart coming together in new ways. And we flourish as we experience reconciliation with God and with one another, and that includes reconciliation with ourselves and our past and our mistakes and our sins. Almost every movie that you love has reconciliation as either a small part or a large part of the story. Third, we flourish as we employ our gifts. When we do have a moment to pause and reflect, do you know what we often think of? We think of our needs. Specifically, the needs we don't think are being met. We tend to see ourselves as a bundle of needs, a jumble of needs. We have needs of love and affirmation. We have needs for personal security. We have needs for our own welfare. We have needs that go along with the lifestyle we want to maintain. We have needs for our personal agenda. And then we have these internal needs. And here's the problem. We dwell on the needs we don't believe that are being met. We think that somehow we're not complete, or we can't be satisfied, or our happiness isn't quite what it should be when our needs are not being met, especially those needs that are connected to the enormous expectations that we have for others, especially those people we live with. It occurs to me that Jesus does not see us first and foremost as needy people. I don't think Jesus sees us as a jumble of needs. I think Jesus sees us first and foremost as gifted people, as people who have been given incredible gifts. Love this picture of kids who painted self-portraits. God loves us with an infinite love, and it's a great gift. God's gives us his presence every single day, and it's a great gift. God gifts us with some great people in our lives, and some of them who aren't that great. But still, God gives us these people, their friends, their family, their people at church, their people we work with, their people we meet. And each one of them has a story. Each one of them is gifted. And there are great gifts that God gives us every day that we take for granted. And God gives us an abundance of real, material blessings. Honestly, don't we all really have more than we need? And the big thing is God gives us talents and abilities and capacities to contribute to the good of all and the good of creation. Jesus doesn't look at us and see us as needy people, but as gifted people. And we flourish when we get over our needy selves and gratefully acknowledge and share our gifts. And fourth, we flourish as we are part of a countercultural community. Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. And he said that in the middle of a contentious conversation. Jesus had healed 
a man born blind. Pharisees had approached him to challenge him and say, why did you do this on the Sabbath? This is breaking one of our laws. And then Jesus tells them this parable about a sheep listening to, sheep listening to the shepherd's voice and following the voice. And this is a story. Let's apply our definition to it. It's a character who wants something that has to overcome a conflict or address a challenge in order to get it. The character is the shepherd. The challenge is the sheep and who they are listening to. Jesus tells us the story so that we will see that he is the shepherd and we are the sheep. And the goal of the story is what? To encourage us and inspire us to listen to the voice of the shepherd. That's the vision for life. That is the abundant life. And the great great grace in it is we do not listen by ourselves, but as a flock, as a community, as the church, a counter-cultural community. Everybody else is listening to a different voice. Everybody else is swimming in a direction. But there are some, one community, listening to another voice, going another way. We flourish as a countercultural community. We flourish as we live our lives different than the ways of the world we flourish as we listen to the shepherd's voice. Where the world values the high and the mighty, the shepherd values the meek and the poor. Where the world prioritizes self-sufficiency and independence, the shepherd prioritizes servanthood and sacrifice. Where the world's agenda is nations and markets, The shepherd's agenda is justice and peace. So we flourish not by doing well in the world, not by just getting along well in the world, not just by fitting in with all the other fish. We flourish as a counter-cultural community listening to the voice of the shepherd where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. And where Jesus is, people flourish. Where Jesus is, people live a larger and better story. Where Jesus is, there is reconciliation. And people can share this reconciliation with others. And where Jesus is, there is gifted people who have incredible talents and capacities waiting to be unleashed. And where Jesus is, there's a group of people who listen to a different voice in order to live a different life. Because Jesus didn't bring these people together to do well in the world, but to change it. We are just lambs. We are just sheep. But the great thing is, we have this wonderful promise from the shepherd. I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Which means we can all flourish. Friends, let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your many, many blessings and gifts, too numerous to count, and of which we 
are not always aware. You are an abundant God, and so much has been given to us. Sometimes we get caught in a feeling of scarcity. Open our eyes and make us aware of your abundance so that we might live bold and faithful lives, lives like the life of the shepherd we seek to follow. Help us to evaluate and make a commitment to his values. And help us to evaluate our priorities and so they might match his. And may we get on his agenda as opposed to just worrying so much about our own. We do pray for those mentioned in our time of joy and concerns. We do pray for a new soul among the living and who arrived a bit early. We pray for health and wholeness. We pray for safe journeys for family traveling and relationships that might blossom. We pray, O oh God, for those that we've placed in hospice. And we pray for the families who make difficult decisions and still have to get along in the midst of all of it. We pray for all who are hurt, hurting and struggling and dealing with issues they wish they didn't have to deal with, but nonetheless have stepped up in order to serve and help. Pray for Ron Case this day. Pray for others we did not mention. For all who grieve, for all who have suffered a loss, for all who have received difficult news, for the injustices in our world, for those in great need, real need, of food and shelter, of meaning and purpose. We pray. At the same time, we thank you for your son, the shepherd sent to lead us. As we go about our lives this week, as we do all our regular stuff, as we go to work or go to school or look through our to-do lists and go about the daily business of our lives, May we hear his voice. May we hear his affirmation. May we hear his grace. May we hear his call. And may we hear his encouraging and inspiring words that we may live abundant lives as individuals and as his church. Hear us as we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and go with you all. Amen.